<clears throat> All right. Hello. Good morning, period four. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, morning, morning. Okay. So I know uh, there's not too many of you today. Um, I understand, you know, a, a, this is AP week. So a lot, a lot of your peers are uh, probably very stressed out slash busy. So as a result, uh, that's, uh, I really need you guys to participate, uh, engage, uh, raise your hand, you know, that whole jazz. Okay. So today's topic is something called the means of correct training. Training for what? Uh, Foucault would say training people to become machines. That was the metaphor we used last time. Today's the 12th. Uh, today's homework is very simple. Just read uh, pages 20 to 23 and then answer discussion board number three. It is already up on Schoology. Um, yep, yeah, and that pretty much would cover it. Now, the big word, if you want to summarize Foucault in like one word, besides panopticon, if you want to uh, summarize him in one word, it's discipline. He's going to make the claim that all of your social institutions, like all of them, even the ones that supposedly are good and benign, all of them, their primary goal is to maintain control and discipline of its population, of its members. Um, a cynical way of viewing institutions, but is he wrong? Let's get into it today. Okay, super quick preview of what we're gonna go over. Uh, a super quick review of Foucault, just to remind you who he is, what his whole thing is about. We're gonna super quickly go over discussion board number two, uh, which was the one about the spoiled brat. Uh, we're gonna ask the question, how do you turn someone into a machine? And then this topic of you being a machine and how you get to become a machine through the means of correct training. So Foucault actually had like a step-by-step -step process of how you could discipline a human being uh, through hierarchical observation, normalizing judgment, and something he called the examination. That'll be the main topic for today. Okay, am I going too fast or is this an okay pace? You're good. All right, sick, thank you, Vivian. <laughs> then let's get into it. So super quick, reintroducing Michel Foucault. So Foucault, known for his bald head and his turtlenecks, uh, was a very famous philosopher and historian. And so the first question I wanna to pose to you, so far, do you agree with his analysis of our modern institutions? Do we indeed live in a disciplinary society? So do you think he's right? Like even um, an institution like school, which is, you know, supposedly about helping you learn and, you know, giving you life skills and socializing you. Isn't the primary goal actually, though, to discipline you, to make you behave like a cog in a machine? Do you agree with him or do you think that's too cynical of a viewpoint? Like all of your social institutions, all of them, church, um, uh, you know, university, um, government, they're all primarily disciplinary in nature. Do you agree? Uh, I see a thumbs up, Giacomo. Could you uh, explain? I mean, I, f I can't really see an institution that's not disciplinary. Right, right yeah. Perhaps by its very modern nature, yeah. they have to be. Um, yeah, and I mean, they can do other things too, of course, but they're all secondary, Foucault says. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Vivian and then Cassie. Um, I agree with Foucault. I think that, like, especially school, like, they put up a facade that we're trying to learn, but I think when we look, like, deep down into it, like, there's so many, like, disciplinary, like, techniques that they use, and, like, I, I think that now that I see that, I can't, like, not see that anymore. Yeah, and you start to see how you're treated more like a piece of meat or a machine than you are um, a person. Um, and part of it, again, is the nature of the institution, the sheer scale of it, the impersonal monolithic nature of an institution, of a modern institution, um, versus, you know, you as one person. We'll get into that in a moment. Um, uh, Cassie? Yeah, like maybe there are some unique cases of institutions that aren't purely based on like turning us into machines, but for the most part, yeah, I agree. Yeah, but you know, I really struggle to think of even one that doesn't try and do that, like a modern social institution. Um, they all kind of do that. Like, I, I, I really struggled to come up with, with a counterexample. Yeah, I agree with you, Mr. Fuentes. Like, it doesn't seem like there is one, in my opinion, as well. <laughs> oh, I, actually, I do want to bring up a really good point someone brought up yesterday. Um, so somebody said, like, wait a minute, Fuentes, what about, like, artists, like, especially, like, musical artists? Because there's a lot of people who don't seem to conform, you know, they even criticize society and, and they do very well. Like, you know, they don't seem to be disciplined. Like someone brought up the example of like Kanye West, okay? Somebody who is a musical artist who makes songs that criticize the society in which he lives in and he seems to gather success. 
I would argue even a musical artist like Kanye West definitely conforms and ironically benefits from the institutions that he's supposedly criticizing because he's fabulously wealthy. And so when people listen to his music, so, okay, for instance, he raps about like, um, you know, um, racial inequality or about income inequality. And the irony is that uh, his music is being consumed by a lot of white people uh, through, you know, digital platforms or physical platforms that require capitalism in order to work. And therefore, it's really like self-defeating in a sense. Like, yeah, he makes a lot of money and he's successful, but that's because he's conformed to a capitalist mode of distribution. Um, he, he, even though he's like a rebellious artist, he's actually a huge conformist as well. We'll go over this idea of conformity in just a moment, but I, I just thought it was an interesting point because somebody thought like, oh, oh, isn't art an institution that can be thought of like not disciplining its members? And I totally disagree. I think the art world absolutely disciplines its members. Um, well, we can talk about fashion too. That's a really good example. We'll get into that in a moment. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry. That was a lot. I, I, I kind of just want to front load all that. Uh, okay, so last time we went over this idea of a spoiled brat. Now, one of the things we determined, and by the way, this class was the only class where a lot of people did advocate to like, uh, <laughs> all of my other classes thought that was so barbaric. They were like, no, no, you can't hate a kid. Uh, this is the only class that was like, oh yeah, yeah, it's fine. Um, oh, that's not true. The, the, the only other class I had was in my other period four. Maybe something about period four, I don't know. Anyway. So one of the big things that we concluded was, okay, regardless of your strategy, of your specific strategy for disciplining your child, um, you have to do one thing first. What's the first thing you need to control? That was last week's topic. What's the one thing, the first thing you need to control in order to talk to your kid or physically discipline them or whatever? Vivian? Uh, you have to be able to control their bodies. Very good, their bodies. Uh, uh, Kaylee, do you remember the phrase that Foucault used, blank bodies? Kaylee? Docile bodies. Very good, that's right. The first step is to make people into docile bodies, is to control their body. And so that's where we're gonna to start today. Uh, in order to turn someone into a machine, in order to discipline them, you must turn them into a docile body. Okay, you have to control their body. Uh, I think I might have asked this class uh, last week, but I'll ask it again because I'm always very curious. Uh, do you guys ever plan on one day being a uh, parent? Or is that like, pfft, no, hell no. I mean, I mean, that's probably an unfair question. It's way too far in the future, but uh would, would i'm just curious like people in your generation like would you guys want to be parents one day is that like a thing or vivian i think that like if i was like financially secure then maybe i'd want to be a parent but as of right now i'm not very financially secure probably won't be because of student debt so uh we'll see in the future <laughs> well big yikes well maybe i mean and that's a very common response and uh you know it makes sense um but, but, but it, it, I guess, is it like a life goal or is it like, eh, if it happens, it happens? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Vivian? You know I, think if, I think if it happens, it happens. Like, but, but I kind of want to focus on a career. <laughs> okay, that's fair. But, so it's not like the goal? No, no, no. Okay, that's fair, that's fair. The rest of y'all? I don't know. I feel like I'm like relatively indifferent. So kind of the same thing. If it happens, it happens. Yeah, yeah like if my significant other wanted to have a kid, I'd have one. And if they don't, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd care. Oh, so it's, it's more up to like who you're with. So if they're like, let's have kids. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, again, I guess I'm just curious because I hear very different responses from kids your, your age. Like some, some of your peers were like, hell no, I never want kids, blah, blah, blah. Some of your peers were, uh, were much more like, oh, yeah, like one day, like I definitely would. I'm just curious. Well, regardless, maybe one day you will. And then you want to remember how to discipline them. And so step one, says Foucault, keep their bodies in line. <laughs> okay, so how do, you, how do you make someone into a docile body or how do you make them into a machine? Well, Foucault says that disciplinary society focuses on this weird phrase he uses, an anatomy of detail. Specifically, he claims that you have to control these three elements to control a body. You have to control a person's space, you have to control a person's time, and you have to control their material objects. So one, two, three. If I can control these three things, I can control your body. By the way, if I cannot control these three things, then Foucault says, discipline of you is impossible. So if I, as your parent, have no control over your space, time, or material objects, I can't discipline you. 
Um, and I think if you stop and think about it, Foucault's right. And that's why like, uh, for instance, like teachers or administrators have issues at school sometimes disciplining students if they don't have access to these um, three things. Like if I don't control where you are, if I don't control like when you're there, and I don't control what you use and interact with, I can't really control you. So does that make sense? One, two, three. Let's go over them in a little bit more detail. Space is pretty obvious. If I can control where you are, I, I can much more easily control you because I can keep track of you. But if I can control, if you can control how and where people move, you can keep better track of them. I mean, imagine trying to manage like animals without enclosures. It, it'd be a nightmare trying to herd cats or something. Um, I guess I gotta ask, why do you think we have fences at school? Let's use school as our example. Why do they have fences at Cleveland? Let's have Kaylee. It's a prison. Well, yeah, exactly. And so what's what, and that, that's Foucault's big metaphor, of course, but what's, what's, what's the purpose of having them? You're right. Um, Vivian? It's to like keep us in like that, like the actual location of Cleveland during the six hours of the day. That's right. It is to keep people out. That's, that's one of the big reasons, oh, for student safety, but also probably more often it's to keep y'all in. Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, they're very stingy with the gate key. And so uh, staff is uh, also trapped in there with y'all. Like we, we, if we want to leave, we have to go through the main office. Um. <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it, and they do that so they can keep track of where you are. I mean, there are very few schools that don't have physical fences, like, um, you know, uh, Nobel is one of the only ones that, that I know in the Valley that doesn't have one. Anyone here go to Nobel? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you went to, oh yeah, but, but, but I hear that not that many kids ditched anyway. No. Is it because they had all this security, right? I don't know if they did have security or they put like the fear that there was security. Oh, oh that's very panoptical. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that on Thursday, but oh yikes. Yeah, yeah, I, I've always thought that's very curious. Uh, we don't have fences, but we have like a perimeter of guards. Like, <laughs> okay. I have seen a lot of people ditch Cleveland though very interesting to watch all the tactics they use oh yeah gosh i mean well look it's it's not that hard physically like the, the hard part is actually i think more mental uh of wanting to escape like if you have basic upper body strength you can jump the fence and i know a lot of kids like to ditch over by uh, e10 because uh, uh, it's a lower wall <laughs> Uh, in fact, I actually, um, Miss O was the one who, who once warned me, All right, you know the parking lot on, on that side of uh, school, you know, in front of the library? Uh, Miss O once warned me, she said, oh, Albert, don't park like in these three spots. And I asked her, how come, Grace? And she says, oh, because kids ditch all the time there, and uh, they throw their backpacks over, and so you don't want it hitting your car. <laughs> I thought, oh, the pro tips. <sighs> anyway, so, okay. Step one, control a person's space. But controlling where they are is not enough. You also need to control their time. You need to control, like you need to know where they are and more importantly, when they're there. So control of people requires precise attention to time. Um, and you're always bombarded with these messages, right? Like things like don't waste your time, spend your time wisely, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me give you an example. Can you imagine high school without a bell schedule? No. Uh, uh, Vivian. Isn't that college? Uh, no, even, I mean, college doesn't have a bell schedule, but even college has a schedule. Oh, right, right. You know what I mean, no, but you're right. It, 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 is, it is a little bit of a difference. Uh, Cassie? I mean, for the first, like, two, two and a half weeks or three weeks of quarantine, we didn't have a schedule, and there were some teachers having classes at the same time, and then there were times where there were no classes on a day, and it was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was utter chaos. Like, like they had the first, like, yeah, the first two weeks of the quarantine. Shoot, I still remember, uh, it's, it almost seems like a dream, like, because uh, I, I gave myself, like, one day to get set up, like, that one Monday. I just like spent the whole day preparing. And then by Tuesday, I was like delivering lectures already. God, that was nuts. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's exactly what it'd be like. It's like, oh, some teacher's doing this. It'd be utter chaos. I guess what I'm trying to also instill in you is maybe Foucault is a little too cynical when he criticizes discipline. Because is discipline necessarily a bad thing? I don't think so. Not, not all the time. No, not all the time. In fact, it can be very useful when you have like self-discipline. I mean, when you can, you know, wake up early, um, eat healthy, exercise, do your work on time. I mean, those are all very useful skills and habits to cultivate. 
So it's not like, oh, discipline, bad. It's just that Foucault's trying to get you to question what, how you're being disciplined and what you're being disciplined for. Um, that's all. So, okay, so you control a person's space, you control a person's time, you put them on a timetable, you can discipline them far easier. You know where they are, you know when they are, and you can, you know, exactly, it's just easier to control. And finally, material objects. There's two parts to this. The first meaning is obvious. Control what people use and interact with. I mean, there's the classic example of like, oh, is that courage? One second. Courage, what are you barking at? All right, courage, enjoy the lecture. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a dog. Okay, so, ah, sorry. Uh, so uh, first control what, what people use and interact with. So for, oh, hey, so for example, uh, what's a very common punishment for uh, parents to give their kids if they misbehave, if they take away their? Phone. Um, yeah, their phone. If you can control what a person uses yeah. and interact with. Now think about school, they take away your phone too. They take away your phone too. They also control like what you can bring to school, how you can dress. Uh, you know, they, 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 they can determine the kind of physical objects that you interact with. Now that part's obvious. However, the more insidious part, and in my opinion more important, is you control people not just by controlling their objects, but by turning them into things, by turning them into material objects. Make them objects in order to fit inside of a well-oiled machine. In other words, your individuality, your individual needs and desires are ultimately irrelevant to an institution. They're irrelevant. You, as an individual, don't really matter. I know that sounds really horrible, but I mean, like, like if you stopped going to Cleveland, would Cleveland just stop functioning? No. There is not a single person at Cleveland that if they left, that the whole school would break down. There's not a single individual, not, not even our principal. We just get a new principal and no teacher. Every, everybody is replaceable in this institution. Um, and so that includes students, that includes teachers, that includes administrators. Oh, you want to go? Okay, we'll just say bye. Say bye, Bridge. Bye. Uh, that includes everybody. Everybody is ultimately replaceable. And what we really want is to turn you into a gear that'll fit very nicely into this machine. That's all. And so Foucault, a big critic of capitalism, basically says that you are being turned into a nice little capitalist cog. That's all. And so you want to get into whatever field, you know, medicine, education, um, uh, engineering, uh, business, whatever. Like, you're just going to perpetuate these horrible systems that you supposedly you hate and criticize. Um, <laughs> we'll get into that later as well with schools. But that's you right there, that little one. Yeah, that little cute gear spinning right there. That's you. <laughs> and that's really like all an institution cares about, says Foucault. Um, again, do you agree with them or do you see this as far too cynical? Cassie? Well, I mean, it's true. Like, I guess, yeah, it's pretty like sad to hear, but like, it's not like it's that hard to wrap my head around the fact that I don't matter in this grand scheme of things because yeah if I miss a day of school everyone still learns what they're gonna learn and it's me who has to catch up eventually it's not the school <laughs> yeah exactly you're the one who's forced to conform not the other way around now again you can make the argument like wait Fuentes but all societies have to function this way like if we had a society where like everyone just like did their own individual desires like it'd be yeah it'd be chaos uh it'd be a hedonistic mess so yeah, to an extent, societies have to, just have, to, have to discipline its members. But, says Foucault, modern societies have gotten, he says, a little too good at it. <laughs> They've gotten too good at turning you into a machine. So, question. Forget about how for a moment. Let's focus on why would you want a human to be turned to a machine? I guess I'll ask, why do you think school doesn't value you as an, as an individual? Like, why do you think school wants to turn you into a machine? Why? Cassie? It's just too many people. I mean, especially in the case of Cleveland, you're a very large school and it would be pretty much impossible given the resources that public schools have. I mean, even any school I feel for each and every kid's needs to be focused on and attended to. 
That's right. I mean, yeah, just from a, from a practical point of view, there's just too many kids. I mean, guys, like me alone, I have, uh, because, you know, I, I teach philosophy, I have over 200 students, <laughs> you know, in core 12. That's ridiculous. I, I, I cannot physically, you know, give all of you individual attention for an extended period of time. That's just not the way it works. And, and if you think I do, that's because I, I make like a huge active effort to do so. <laughs> and so, but, but it's really hard. Um, as opposed, if I had like 20 kids, I mean, pff, then it'd be a lot easier to maintain relationships to, to, you know, meet individual needs and desires. But as it stands, it's like, it's just not practical from, from, from that point of view. So yeah, that's exactly why. And the, the chaos that would ensue if we just like let every kid kind of have their, uh, their way. So that, that's part of it for sure. Um, oh. So uh, I was gonna show you this, but YouTube keeps flagging it. It's, it's, it's a little music video. I don't know if you guys have ever seen uh, Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall. Yeah, we yeah. saw it in a pair offs class. Oh, well, pair off showed it to you? Yeah, yeah, a few kids mentioned that, yeah. I mean, that, it's, it's a good song, great album. Uh, that's the only, uh, the music video does a good job illustrating, but whatever. Okay, but now let's get into what might interest you, and especially if you ever plan on being a parent. <laughs> Uh, this is the way that you discipline children and also the way that uh, societies and institutions discipline you. The means of correct training. One, hierarchical observation. Two, normalizing judgment. And three, the examination. This is what we're going to go over today uh, right now. So in order, one, two, three. Is everyone with me? Are you with me, Karish? <laughs> Good boy. All right. So let's get into it. Courage, you ready to, to, to explain this? <laughs> He's so fat. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so, of course, uh, just to keep things simple, let's use as an example. Ah, beautiful Cleveland. I can't believe I actually missed this ugly facade. Look, you can even see like the painted over graffiti. I even miss it. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going back today. Um, it's actually the, uh, the uh, it's the first time I've been, I'm going to be back on campus uh, since since the lockdown began. Because uh, I need to pick up a number of materials, especially books that I left behind. Um, so I'll be going today. Ooh, should I live stream that? Yes. <laughs> I'll probably do that on Instagram. Let's see. Anyway, so we're going to use Cliven as an example. Uh, are you guys feeling a little nostalgic for it? Or are you kind of like glad like <laughs> we're no longer going there? <laughs> you don't have to say that on camera. It would have been nice to have like a final day there. Yeah, I know, I know, but I spent four freaking years here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know, but but I think we have to agree it is an ugly school. <laughs> Why did they choose orange? It's not even a school color. <laughs> I know it, it's a gross color, and it's, it's like this like terracotta or yeah. Don't get me started on it. Okay, anyway, <laughs> let's just use Cleveland as our example. Okay, <clears throat> hierarchical observation. Step one. Basically, it means when you are constantly being observed or monitored by people with power over you. Okay, at Cleveland High, who is that? Who has power over you at Cleveland? Vivian? Um, like our teachers that we go to their classes to like every day. Very good. Your teachers, um, administrators, uh, Abraham and his cart. Uh, those are all examples of people with power that watch over you. And so how do you behave when you know you're being watched? Vivian? Um, when like you're being watched, you like conform to like the rules and like you stay disciplined the way they want you to be disciplined. Like you don't act out. You don't act out because you're scared to act out because you don't want to get punished. That's exactly right. Um, and it, 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 this applies even to me because you might think like, oh, Fuentes is so nice. Yeah, but, but I, I still discipline you. Just I, I think I do it in a more subtle way because uh, <laughs> I have to maintain control of my classroom too. It, it, it's not possible to be a teacher without maintaining control of like, you know, 30 or 40 kids. Um, yeah, I have to maintain discipline. I think though Foucault would agree that the most effective disciplinarians are actually the ones that uh, are the most subtle. Like if you don't know that you're being disciplined, um, it's, it's gonna be more effective. But okay, but when you know that you're being watched, and I know some of you are scared of like, you know, some teachers more than others. Um, <laughs> but if you know you're being watched, then yeah, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna act up. You're gonna, you're gonna or, or, or I'm sorry, you're not gonna act up you're gonna act like the way that you think they want you to act up. So that's gonna lead us to today's thought experiment. Hierarchical observation. 
You see that courage? Nice. <laughs> Today's thought experiment is called, appropriately enough, The All Seeing Eye. Uh, shout out to anybody who recognizes the theme song. What is this from? Oh, come on. Nobody knows? It's Lord of the Rings. Ugh. It's for me, nerds. <laughs> anyway. No Lord of the Rings fans in here? You guys suck. Okay. Then this is a thought experiment for today. <clears throat> uh, by the way, this thought experiment could be thought in many ways as the opposite of the Ring of Gygus. If you guys recall, the Ring of Gygus was a thought experiment about the guy who finds the Ring of Invisibility and then uses it to you know, commit all manner of crimes. It is kind of the opposite. Imagine that tomorrow an all-seeing eye appears that watches your every move. This could be God, it could be the FBI, it could be the Eye of Sauron, whatever. You are constantly monitored in everything you do. You're watched at school. You're watched walking home. You're watched driving. You're watched in the restroom. You're watched in your most vulnerable, intimate, and awkward moments. How might your behavior change? Now, before you just give a cavalier, keep in mind that this all-seeing entity can and will inform other people about your behavior. Your privacy is effectively gone. So I ask again, how might your behavior change? If, this, if you knew this all-seeing eye was seeing you and then reporting your behavior to other people. Start with Vivian. Um, this, this made me automatically think about like AP exams because like there's like a lot of like talk if like college work can like look through your webcam and like watch you take the test. Yeah, and so like with that in mind, like if I knew the college board was going to watch me take the test. I'm obviously not going to be like searching up every answer on Google or like talking to my friends about it. Um, right. So like it makes me when I feel like I'm being watched, like even a grocery store, I'm gonna act like disciplined. I'm gonna stay yep. ordered and follow the rules that they want me to do. Yes, because you're scared of getting in trouble. Uh, and that's yeah, if you know you're being recorded, for example, or you know that somebody's watching you through a webcam. I mean, I assume that's why all of you have your webcams off right now. <laughs> uh, you know that that's that, that's part of it. We don't like being seen. You go, we can go all the way back to Sartre for that one. Uh, you know, the gaze of the other. Uh, which incidentally, I don't think, I, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Sartre actually had a pretty profound influence on Foucault. Um, they actually knew each other, kind of like Sartre at the end of his career when he was, you know, a very old man, kind of met a young Foucault. And in a sense, there's like a bit of a, like passing of the torch, like, you know, the, the premier French intellectual. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So I, I think Sartre really influenced Foucault, right? The case of the other. Okay. So I think Vivian's right. How might your behavior change? Like specifically, does anyone have an answer? I guess I can just pick on someone. Uh, oh, Cassie, go ahead. I would try my best to conform to the standards that society perfe perpetuates so that you don't deviate from what is seen as normal so that if this little snitch goes around being like, oh, well, Cassie did this, Cassie did that, the response is just like, yeah, and instead of like, ew, or whatever. Right, no, exactly. And I mean, think, think about it. Like, um, you can no longer like talk shit without, you know, that person knowing that you were talking shit. Uh, and we love talking shit as, as, <laughs> as, as a society, but imagine if that's gone, that privacy. Now, a lot of you might not think it's that big of a deal because in a lot of ways, your privacy is gone. Um, in, uh, on Silva's side, a few weeks ago, I mean, you guys read all those articles about how you're constantly being monitored, right, online? Yeah. In a sense, your privacy is kind of diminishing. It's not totally gone yet, but it is diminishing at a pretty alarming rate. And I think what's so interesting to me is that uh, many people in your generation, since you grew up with, you know, things like social media, and with internet surveillance, a lot of you think it's kind of normal and like, eh, like whatever, it's not that big of a deal. Like, oh, so I get targeted ads, <laughs> big whoop. Um, which by the way, I think is really funny. <laughs> Nike, Nike, Nike shoes, ad. I hope your phone's nearby. Ad, Nike. <laughs> Tell me if you get any ads, that'd be hilarious. Uh, but the point is like, is, is like a, lot of people, a lot of us think it's pretty benign. Like, oh, it's, it's like, it's not a huge deal. It was just targeted ads. Foucault wanted to make the argument that if you get rid of privacy, democracy is dead. 
if people cannot privately disagree and kind of cultivate their own points of view and critical thought, then you can't have a functional democracy. If all of your points of view are public, then you're at the whims of like the mob, the gen, uh, you know, the, the, the majority. Cassie? Cassie? In this hypothetical, is there like a punishment for not abiding by the rules or is it just kind of like societal shaming sort of thing? That is the punishment. Like okay. you, you can be ostracized. I'll, I'll give you an example in court. Okay. So, uh, and, and by the way, Foucault was, uh, and I think he started with sexuality because, you know, he was a gay man at a time when obviously that was like even less accepted than today. And, you know, he thought, imagine a world in which, you know, his, his sexuality could just be outed. Like he had no privacy. Um, that'd be pretty horrible. And so that's kind of the point that he started out and he was able to apply that to the rest of society. Um, but, 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 but I guess the other point I want to make is, okay, in core, we have like, you know, let's just be honest, we, we have a pretty like political bias, right? We're pretty liberal, we're pretty left-leaning for the most part. What happens to students in core who express a conservative opinion or, or even just an opinion that disagrees with the, with the, with the majority of political opinion? What, what do we do to those kids? Cassie? Teachers may or may not yell at them slash sort of have other students look down on that student. Yeah, I mean, okay, so first of all, teachers themselves could be the ones to kind of lead the charge, and I'm guilty of this too. Um, you know, uh, 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 teachers may end up reinforcing that, or your peers just may end up like socially ostracizing them, you know, talking shit about them behind their back, saying, oh, I can't believe so-and-so said so-and-so, or I can't believe so Like, you know, when you, when you take any controversial issue, like what if a core kid is like, I don't know, like pro-gun rights or, um, uh, you know, uh, pro-life or, you know, just some, some, uh, they're against affirmative action. Like, you know, something that's like against the grain. Uh, and by the way, this could apply either way. If you're a liberal kid in a conservative school, it, it's the same thing. It's just uh, the political views are switched. Um, what happens to that kid who, vo who voices, or when people know that they have a different political opinion? Well, like, what, what, be honest, what, what, what do we tend to do? We enter into reasonable discussion. Uh, Cassie. I, I know for me that for, for me, it's more like a, a distancing sort of thing, yeah. ironically, yeah. right now. But like for me, I kind of just like keep my, my face from that person if I know that they have a differing opinion for me, especially because I encounter a lot of people not physically with differing opinions so I kind of just like don't want to replicate that in my actual life that's right and so yeah so you'll avoid them now imagine if and that's that's pretty passive it's not like you're actively you know harming them or anything um but imagine if like everyone does that <laughs> uh then the, the, their sense of uh, you know feeling ostracized and then uh that behavior they're, they're either going to correct their behavior um or they're just going to feel you know really left out um, and so then the majority behavior is further reinforced because then you'll get together with other people who share your point of view and join them in either talking shit about, you know, other people, um, just to reinforce your, your majority viewpoint. That's all. And when you think about what's happening in this country right now, where people do not seem to live in the same reality, um, like it's weird. It, 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 the people's opinion of, of like, you know, the coronavirus is, is largely determined by their political views. It's really bizarre. It's like, generally speaking, Democrats in this country take it far more seriously than Republicans. Um, it's weird. It, it really feels like we don't even live in the same, yeah, like reality. Um, and so if you can't, if you lose the ability to learn how to like deal with people who think differently than you, then yikes, then how do we enter it into a democracy? <laughs> Uh, scary, scary. But just some, there's something to keep in mind. That's what Foucault is trying to get us to see. Yeah. Any other comments? Uh, how might your behavior change if you knew that you're being watched? Um, uh, Giacomo, would you be totally okay with us knowing like your browser history? <laughs> I'll take your silences in now. <laughs> would you guys be totally okay with like your browser history being totally public? My browser history consists of like nail polish and Markiplier. Oh, gross! It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I think the vast majority of us would be like, mm, "Nah, I don't, don't want to make that public." 
it's just weird, you know, because it's, it's in a sense like it's nobody's business. And when somebody makes it their business, um, your behavior will then change. I mean, you're way more likely to behave on like, you know, school uh, uh, computer, right, for example, than on your own personal one. The, the kind of things that you would look up, you know, the kind of um, materials you would access are probably going to be different, <laughs> depending. Any, any other comments or questions? Oh, my dog's in a really good mood this morning. He's normally not like this. <laughs> Chubby boy. Yes, Vivian. I feel like this thought experiment is like giving me like handmaid's tale back <laughs> vibes because like they had like the eye that like watched everyone. Yeah, good. I'm really like, glad you brought that up. Yeah, it's very yeah. Like, Orwellian, very like dystopian, very like Big Brother is watching. Um, absolutely, yeah. And then people's behavior will totally change depending on if they know they're being watched. So, okay, that's the first thing to know. If you're being watched, your behavior is changing. Uh, it has to change. Like right now, I can't see you and I have no way to monitor you. So there's no way that I can discipline you. But if I could like access, um, you know, your camera, for example, then you'd probably be a lot more, you know, you'd probably conform a lot more. Okay, so once you kind of determine who, that you're being watched, then you're judged. And this leads to something called the normalizing judgment. In other words, controlling a mass of behaviors by establishing and rewarding what is normal, and then the opposite, by punishing what is abnormal or deviant. Okay, so let's, kind of, let, let's, let's, let's think about Cleveland. How do we utilize normalizing judgments at Cleveland High School? So let's, let's stick with Cleveland. So going back to this definition, how do we do this at Cleveland High School? How do we control a mass of behaviors by establishing and rewarding what's normal? Vivian. I feel like with like honors, like honor rolls or like the perfect attendance people, like you get rewarded if like you, you have like a certain GPA or attendance. And so that like affects others so I like want to do that as well. Very good, that's precisely right. Um, uh, by, by, by dividing kids into different um, SLCs, different like, you know, honor rolls, valedictorians. Yeah, you, you, you categorize people. Uh, very good, Kaylee? Just grades in general. Yes. Yes, grades in general. You, if you conform, you get the A. If you don't conform, you tend to get shittier grades. Okay, I gotta ask you an honest question. The kids who get A's, the A students, are they always the smartest students? No. No, I can tell you this as a, as a student and as a teacher, no. Uh, are the students who get A's necessarily the most hardworking students? No. No. No, definitely not. Uh, uh, it's, I've seen plenty of kids that work really hard but just can't get past the B. I've seen uh, kids that are really lazy but still get the A. Um, I've seen kids that are uh, very intelligent that get A's. I've seen kids that are very intelligent that don't get A's. And I've seen kids that get A's and are not all that. So what then determines if you're an A student? It doesn't measure your ability, your, your intelligence. It doesn't measure your uh, work ethic, what do grades actually measure when you stop and think about it? Your ability to do what? Kaylee? The ESSA system to make it look like you're conforming. Yeah, conforming, that's all. To get the A, you just learn to play the game, especially like the, that particular teacher. If you just do what the teacher tells you to do, you get the grade. It, it really is that simple. Uh, I know it sounds awful and makes grades seem really uh, arbitrary, but that's because they are. They're totally just made up. It's like dog treats for students. Uh, it, 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 when you stop and think about it, it's like, okay, in order to get the A in a class, you just do what the teacher tells you to do. That's it. Uh, and so, and you're rewarded for that conformity with good grades. And then guess what? With those good grades, you can then go to a college, which will only further discipline you in the sense of it'll make you conform. So that sounds like a very cynical, very like sour grapes way of looking at it, but the quote unquote best students are the best conformists, not the brightest, not the most talented, not the most hardworking. I mean, obviously many of them are, but the number one skill is conformity. And so the kids that go to like prestigious universities are just the biggest conformists, that's all. They just learned how to play the game. They got the grades by doing what the teacher did, you know, wanted them to do, jumping through those hoops. They uh, probably logged a whole bunch of volunteer hours at places they don't really care about just so it'll look good on a resume. Um, and that's it. Uh, maybe some extracurriculars here and there they did just for the specific purpose of looking better for colleges. Uh, <laughs> okay, but now we come to the really horrible part. 
if somebody benefits from this system, okay, can we all agree that the college admissions process is absolute bullshit? Yes. Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's, it's bullshit. It, it's, it's like this weird, unclear, almost mystical, like arcane way of like choosing kids. Like it's not clear how colleges do it. I'm sure all colleges do it differently. It's like a crapshoot. You, you just don't know. Uh, on a given year. And maybe like if you had applied the year before or the next year, you would have gotten in. Like you, you just don't know. There's no like metric. But here's the problem. We all agree it's broken. But if you get into the school that you wanted to, you get into, you know, UCLA, are you then likely to want to change the system? No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Uh, yeah, well, what incentive do you have to change a system that benefits you? Cassie? Well, if you're already into the school and you can still recognize that the way in which you got into the school you wanted to wasn't maybe the best, you could still reflect and know that it wasn't that good. And then do what? I mean, you can still try to fix it, not saying that every person would, because not every person would, but maybe there's some like saint out there who's like, let's fix the college admission process. Maybe, but... Foucault would say that's very difficult, like almost impossible to do when, you, when, you, when you've directly benefited from the system and are way entwined in it. There's just no incentive for you. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it, it sounds really awful, but like some of our best and brightest students then are just big conformists. And by the way, Foucault is a big critic of capitalism. And he says, the root cause of so much inequality is because of, of, of class, is because of uh, you know, the haves and the have-nots, uh, class inequality. And in capitalism, there will always have to be winners and losers. And so reform just puts a bandage on the problem. Um, and you can shift around wealth, but ultimately there will always be a disparity. So deep rooted problems like um, racism, sexism uh, are gonna continue. Sorry, one second. Sorry, we're good, we're good. So a lot of those um, social problems will continue to perpetuate because nobody wants to take a stand against them. Okay, because what if you had a student that didn't get accepted into any of the colleges that she applied to? And then she turns around and says, guys, this process sucks, it's, it's totally rigged. What are people gonna say to her? Vivian? They're gonna be like, no, like it's not rigged because I got into college or that person got into college. So like, it, it's, it's fair, but like, that, that's right. Like, like, like you're just salty that you didn't get it is something is something you might believe or, or think, which again, only reinforces the system that we all know is broken. <laughs> and so as long as you benefit from the system, look, as long as you're trying to get like a decent, well-paying job and become a cog in a capitalist machine, you're not going to want to change the system. A lot of us are just here to, you know, be financially secure, maybe with the dream of one day getting a house or, you know, property of some kind, starting a family even. And then, you know, then you're totally bought into the system. They're not going to want to make any major changes. <laughs> and so Foucault is actually a big uh, critic of reform for that reason. He says reform doesn't really work. It just makes the horrible corrupt system more bearable. And perhaps it puts a pretty face on it, but that's it. And so normalizing judgment is when you control a massive behaviors by, oh, you're going to college? That's normal and rewarding that versus, oh, you're not going to college or, uh, or I guess in core, it, th th there's still that stigma, I think, of uh, CC, right? Community college, is, is, is that still a thing? Like there's a little bit of a stigma against like kids that are going to CC as opposed to a four-year university. That's the way it was when I was a kid. Cassie? I mean, there's definitely less of a stigma and a lot more kids are doing it, especially with the option to transfer after two years, so like the two-year, two-year sort of solution. Mm -hmm. I know that's probably what I'm going to be doing, which also paired with the whole gap year and then quarantine, it's all messed up, but it's fine. Um, yeah, 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 so no. I think there's definitely less of a stigma, but I feel like the stigma is now l less coming from fellow students and more coming from like adults. <laughs> yeah, I believe so but, you know, your parents, friends, friend or whatever, they're all like, oh, my God, you've grown so much. What college are you going to? They don't want to hear, like, I'm going to Pierce. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you know, and why do they care? <laughs> like, what business is it of theirs? They, they, they just want the prestige so they can, uh, they can do a normalizing judgment. 
oh, you're going to Pierce. Oh, you're going to Santa Monica. Oh, you're going to CSUN. Oh. And in all fair, it, 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 frankly, the kind of education that you receive at those schools is probably just as good as the education you're going to get at like a four-year university, especially for your, um, your, your, uh, for undergrad, especially for like your lower divisions. It's the same. The difference is the environment and the kinds of students that you're going to interact with. Because logically, if you go up to like Berkeley, you're going to encounter a lot more type A, you know, super chickens. Versus in Santa Monica, the people are going to be a little bit like more chill, more like, you know, um, it's going it's to be a different vibe. Um, the, the, and so it depends on what kind of environment you want. Do you do good in a high pressure environment? Like, do you want that kind of pressure? Um, and if not, then why are you going <laughs> and paying all that money? So just think about like what's subtly and subliminally controlled in your behavior by normalizing judgments. Okay, does that, does that make sense? Cool. All right. So let me get to the really big example, though, that I really want to talk about. Social media. Uh, I think I told you guys before, but I hate social media. Um, and in fact, I actually did not have a social media account um, for a long time. Like I disabled it for almost a year and I only reactivated it because of this, you know, crisis, because I want to be uh, in contact with people. And so uh, Otherwise, I hate social media for the reasons that I'm about to tell you. Social media, and let's just focus on Instagram because it's pretty popular. I know there's like Twitter and whatever, but let's just focus on Instagram. Um, I would argue that Instagram is a hotbed of normalizing judgments and it's a, actually a way of getting people to conform to like normal societal expectations. I guess I have to ask for those of you who use Instagram, is there like an unwritten rule about like using Instagram and like what, what you can post and shouldn't post? Are there a bunch of unwritten rules? Cassie? Maybe this is just my experience on Instagram, but to me, the whole point of Instagram is to like share whatever part of your life you want to share. So I've never noticed any like mm -hmm. inherent like oh, you can't do that sort of thing, unless it's like a sort of thing that like societally you can't do. I don't think there's any specific rules for Instagram, but. Now, now maybe you're right, Cassie, maybe you're right. And, and Foucault obviously did not live long enough to see um, social media, but, but, but for the sake of argument, I'm gonna disagree with you. I'm gonna say, no, I think there are. And I think you, you should look more carefully. Um, Vivian, what were you gonna say? Oh, I just wanna say like, I think I disagree with Cassie because like, I feel like, the rule is that on Instagram, you post your nice pictures, your nice sunset pictures, your food pictures, your college pictures. But then on Snapchat is when you post your chaotic, like, crackhead self pictures. Right. And, so, and people have different accounts on, on Instagram, too, right? There's, like, meme accounts, you know, burn accounts, it's just the dumb stuff like that. And so there's a bunch of unwritten rules, I think. And, and yeah, the kind of content you post. And, I, and, and you're naming off a whole bunch of you. Like, the most common ones. By the way, so I, I add students once they graduate on Instagram. And I, I always see the most inane bullshit that people post. It's always selfies, um, food, uh, travel locations, especially like vacation stuff. Or like, you know, I went on this hiking trail. Ah. Uh, oh, my pet peeve is uh, when people go watch the wild, uh, go, go uh, to the wildflowers or, uh, or the poppies. Oh my God. You know, I think it was like two years ago or maybe even last year when, when the wildflowers were in bloom, there were so many people that went up to the hills, you know, up north of the, of the, of the valley to go see them that uh, they were actually damaging the like like the the oh my god I'm blanking out the um the ecosystem out there there were so many people trampling around like so many white girls wanted to get like pictures with uh with the poppies that they were actually damaging the flowers uh themselves and so it's this weird perpetuating system where it's like somebody sees like oh people are taking pictures pretty pictures of those pretty flowers I want to do that and then they do it uh, people take the same stupid photos. Like there's that dumb like angel photo like down in LA, I forget exactly where it is. Like every like basic uh, person on Instagram goes and like takes that photo. Uh, Cassie? Just this week, a lot of people were going to the beaches to watch the bioluminescent waves. Yes, okay, now here's the thing. In <laughs> social media, like you, Foucault would say you unconsciously, without really thinking about it, you just copy what other people are doing. That's it. And so it's a way of like reinforcing and normalizing behavior. Consume, buy X thing, 
eat X thing, go to X place. Now, again, it's not necessarily a bad thing because then you can use it to spread good information. You can use it to like promote things. You can use it to, you know, it can be used for good. It's not necessarily a force of bad in our society. All I'm saying is that it often is. <laughs> and it's used to perpetuate points of view that uh, aren't necessarily good for a functional democracy or a society. And unfortunately, uh, and as you got into with Silva's class, your feed is very much a bubble, uh, you know, of people who tend to agree with you or, or like the same things that you like. And so that's dangerous, says, says Foucault, and especially for, uh, for democracy. I mean, imagine, like, um, I have seen, like, teenagers, like, physically fight over, like, one of them, like, took a picture of the other one and was going to post it. Then that's a damn post it. It's like, oh, my God, who cares? But, but of course, okay, and on Instagram, what's the normalizing judgment? How do people judge your content, like your photos or your videos? What's, what's the method through Instagram? Vivian? Liking and commenting. Liking and commenting. Wait, Vivian, that wasn't even you. Okay, but yeah, but still, yes, liking and commenting. Uh, th that's how you do it. You know, uh, YouTube, liking and subscribing, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's the method by which you uh, you know, judge someone. It's a normalizing judgment. So when you consider like, um, uh, again, on Instagram, uh, if somebody were to really post something unique, something that was like totally theirs, that totally flaunts the unwritten rules of Instagram, either one of two things would happen. Either they have just set a new trend, in which case people start copying them, or more likely they just thought, they just thought it was kind of weird and people just don't like or comment on their photo. Very few people, I, I feel, would publicly go out of their way to shame them. Although, of course, there's, you know, bullying. But, uh, you know, you just judge it. It's like, oh, that's weird. It's the same thing with, like, art or fashion. Like, um, in core, is there, like, a fashion in core? Like, oh, core kids dress this way. Vivian? Um, I, I think there is kind of, like, a fashion in core. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially during IUE week when everyone wants to, like, wear their PJs or, like, wear their sweatpants and, like, put their <laughs> hair in a bun. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, like, that classic. It, it was since, it, it's, it's since uh, I was a kid, really. Like, um, core kids, like, oh, they love thrift shopping. Uh, all, like, the girls that wear, like, the Doc Martens and the skirts. Uh, <laughs> there's, like, a look, you know? Like, it, like if, if you were to go to Cleveland, and it's and you have a lineup of kids. Could you spot the core kid? Probably you could. <laughs> but okay, the real irony that I wanted to point out with, especially let's using fashion, is if if you're into fashion, that's all well and good. I mean, it's it's a nice hobby, it's an activity, perhaps it's a passion of yours. That's fine. I just want you to recognize that if you follow fashion, you're a conformist because you're just following established trends of like what's what, what looks good or what's cool and yeah people say like well you get your own unique fashion right like yeah sort of but you mostly just copy something that you think looks really cool um you don't like make up if you were to truly make up 100 percent your own fashion you'd be the weird kid that no one really talks to <laughs> there's, there's there's conformity uh and, and i want you to recognize that uh social media has become a tool of conformity um at least, again i'm arguing purely through foucault it's possible that I'm being overly cynical, but I really want you to think about it. Okay. Ah. So what does a normal core kid look like? I mean, is there like a look that a core kid has? Like you look at a kid at Cleveland and you think, oh yeah, they're probably in core. Vivian? Maybe it's not like a for sure look but like, I think there's a way that core kids hold themselves or like stand or walk in comparison to other people, especially at Cleveland when you're comparing like, like core or like SAS or like residential, like core students have like a vibe that you just kind of know that they're in core. Oh yeah, totally. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think I have a word for it. It's, it's called arrogance. Uh, <laughs> by and large, I've noticed that core kids, and this is myself included, I'm the worst. Uh, I'm like the core kid uh it, it's it's yeah it's like an arrogance of like oh you know our program is so much better like oh like we learned this and that and like all right like slow your roll we're not that special um <laughs> but, but but i agree that there is a way in which core kids like handles and not every single kid in core is like this obviously 
And some kids conform to that more than others. And there's some kids that don't conform to it at all. Like you guys have heard that expression of like, there are core kids, but there's also just kids that are in core. Um, and so, you know, it, people have unique experiences, but for the most part, I think there is a large degree of conformity. Okay, last topic for today, and then we'll break. The examination. So first is your observed hierarchical observation. Second is there's a normalizing judgment, but then there must be a means or a method by which individuals are classified and judged, and this is called the examination. Now, this could be a literal exam, like, you know, like in school, like an actual test, but it could take the form of any um, method that you use to, to essentially evaluate people. For example, did you guys ever think it's weird that school grades are very similar to the way that we grade meat, like the USDA grades meat? A, B, C. <laughs> Do you guys know that? that? That's the way the USDA uh, grades meat, like the quality of it? I did not know that, but that is kind of odd. Yes, and a little dehumanizing, uh, especially when you consider like, okay, that means that you are essentially, again, treated like a piece of meat. And there's A quality meat, B quality meat, et cetera, et cetera. How do we reward our A quality meat at school? Vivian? You give them like the, the label of like valedictorian or like honor roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. them. Yep, you give them like a little sash, you give them like a little special tassel, you give them like the cords and stuff. Uh, yeah, you can call them valedictorian, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you give them all these bells and whistles, like, ooh, you know, uh, and, and, and it's like the reward that you get, you know, grades too. And if you don't conform, you know, you're sent to the principal's office, the dean, detention, you know, things like that, et cetera, et cetera. And so the examination is the means by which individuals are classified and judged. Um, so if I give you like a pop quiz, for example, what am I actually determining? Let, let, let's say, okay, I'm not actually going to give you a pop quiz, but let's say like I gave you a pop quiz. What am I trying to determine, says Foucault? Like, what am I actually evaluating? It's not your knowledge. What am I actually evaluating if I, as the teacher, give you a pop quiz? Cassie? To me, it's just how well you are paying attention. That's right. I'm just, uh, I'm checking to see how well you're conforming. Are you following my classroom rules? Are you paying attention? Because that's one of the rules in my classroom. That's it. Uh, it's not actually to test your knowledge. It's just to keep you in line. It's to um, help you conform. It's to, in one word, discipline you. That's all. That's all the an examination is used for. Because when you start and ask yourself, well, what is the ideal student? Um, oh, uh, well, we don't have to get all into this, but Okay, let me make this very, very simple. So kind of ignore the text for now. If an A student is, a, is, a, is the best conformist, then you, that, that means, okay, guys, in order to do well on a test, what's more useful, knowing the content or knowing how to take a test? Knowing how to take a test. Yeah. And by the way, you can apply this to APs as well. Why do they give you AP exams? Like, why do they put so much emphasis on AP? Oh, because you're an expert on literature and chemistry now? Because they care about if you can take a specific test that they made. Yeah. Guys, you ever think it's weird that the college board, like the ones that like make the test are also the ones that make a shitload of money by like providing materials for studying for the test? Like it's, it's a private company. You guys know the college board is not a government sponsored um, uh, bureau. It's, it's, it's a private corporation. LAUSD pays them money for them to provide materials. It's kind of a racket when you stop and think about it. Like the College Board is kind of ridiculous. It's a private company that makes up tests and then provides materials for those tests. Schools have no input in them. Uh, an AP teacher has no input in the curriculum that they, that they teach because they have to teach the test. Like, like, of course, yeah, don't get me wrong. There's little things that, 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 that an AP teacher can do, but they're really beholden to the test because then they're going to be evaluated as a bad teacher for not conforming to the AP exam. <laughs> and what kind of kids take APs? Nerds. Uh, <laughs> kids that will conform and just do exactly what the teacher and the test uh, expect you to do. APs are the best example of conformity of examinations. That's all. They're not testing to see how well you know literature. They're testing to see how well you know their tests. And that's why everyone's freaking out right now because they have to change the format so dramatically. 
so quickly. Vivian? Yeah, I feel like that's like a large part of the SAT as well, because like the SAT isn't that hard of like English or math, but like half of the SAT is like just knowing like how much time you have per section or like the amount of sections you have to take, like it's the format. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's all about the, yeah, the format, the, the way in which it's done. Yeah. Kaylee? I mean, the AP Lit test has absolutely nothing to do with literature. It's just figuring out how to like analyze a passage the way you want it to. It has absolutely nothing to do with knowing literature. It's so stupid. Correct. Yeah, and it's a bunch of like facts like, um, uh, what is a soliloquy? Uh, what is, um, uh, you know, just all these like really obscure, like poetic terms too, that unless you're a trained poet, you're not going to like ever want or use to need to know. It's just conformity. That's all. Um, it's a standardized test. Again, a standardized test. It's attempting to kind of mold you into one kind of person, into a machine. That's it. Now, last thing for today. How much time do we have? Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Last thing for today. How do we keep track of all of these examinations? Easy, record keeping. Everybody has a file on them, and it can be very unnerving to see how much of your life is reported. Okay, this might shock you. Have you guys ever heard of something called a QM folder? Okay, I didn't make this up. This isn't like a dirty joke, I swear. It's called a QM folder. Have you guys ever heard of that? No. Okay, so again, funny name. Ho, ho, ho. You can, you can laugh. But a QM folder is short for cumulative folder. Okay, I got a question. In elementary school, did your teacher ever threaten you like, if you misbehave, this is going on your permanent record? Do you guys ever get a threat like that? Yes. Okay, they weren't kidding. There is such a thing as a permanent record. It's called a cum folder, a cumulative folder. As soon as you enter into any institution, like public institution, actually, no, I think privates too. Any school in the United States, they automatically start a, a folder on you, a, a, a dossier. So if you entered, you know, in kindergarten, it started from kindergarten. And what they do is they put in like all sorts of information, teacher reports, parent conferences, uh, awards. Like if you got student of the month, it's in there. Uh, disciplinary referrals, uh, any detentions that you got, uh, health records, dental records. They have pictures of you from year to year. Like if you were to look into your folder, they have like first grade you, second grade you, third grade you. And then when you, go, when you finish elementary school and you go to middle school, they send that folder to your middle school. And then from middle school, they sent it to Cleveland. So right now, there is a folder on you, a thick folder sitting in an office uh, filing cabinet at Cleveland High. And it's filled with all sorts of information, like anything that happened to you, like tests, work, uh, again, referrals, uh, meetings, uh, 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 anything at all is in there right now, <laughs> including your, uh, you know, your, your senior portraits, your everything. And so you can actually see a progression. I, I, and they're really stingy about them. Like, if I want to access a student's Q folder, I have to fill out a whole form and I can't take it out of the room. I have to like see the contents of the room while I'm inside the room. I can't take it out. Um, it's crazy how detailed they are. Do, do you guys know about that? I assume you're stunned speechless. Okay. Uh, this is like kind of crazy, but like, why don't kids get access to like their own folders? <laughs> So, so this is weird. Um, you can request access once you graduate, but this is the weird part, Cal. They make it really hard. Like it's possible. And some kids have actually gotten their folder, but um, it's really hard. They make it really difficult to access your own information. Uh, you have to like fill out this form. They probably like make you go in this. And I mean, now during this, this, this pandemic, it's going to be even harder for you, but they make it hard. And I, I guess I got to ask, why do you think they make it so difficult to access your own information? What do you think? Uh, it's probably so, like, you're forced to conform more. Um, it's like, if you don't know what people are reporting on you, then you're probably just going to conform so you get good reports anyway. That's precisely right. Yeah, that's it. it, it it's, 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 it's all about power and making you conform. Vivian? Um, I just have a question. Like, doesn't, like, a, an idea of, like, a record follow us, like, throughout our jobs? So, like, if we were to, like, go to jail, like, it'd be, like, on our like quote unquote record, correct. even if it's not physical. Correct. And I mean, now that we're moving into a digital space where like, you know, we don't even necessarily have like uh, physical files anymore, you know, it's all digital. It's even more uh, detailed and precise. Oh God. Yeah. Heaven forbid you ever get a criminal record that will follow you around for the rest of your life. Um, that's really tough. And, and, and it seems unfair, especially once you've served your, you know, debt to society. Vivian? It's like, 
Because I, I read an article about how, like, the NFL draft tells, it, like, its players, like, to watch your social media record because they can go back and, like, look at all your tweets or, like, the racist things you said in the past and, like, it'll, it'll all come up at the end. Yes. I feel bad for your generation for that reason because every dumb thing that you guys do has probably been recorded somewhere, either on social media or, you know, by someone, et cetera, et cetera. It sucks. It, it comes back and it bites you in the ass. Like if you ever want to like get into like a, if you want to, if you want to be a, a public uh, figure, whether in politics or sports or, or, or whatever, a lot of that bullshit can come back up and bite you. Even though you said something like, let's, let's say you said something racist when you were like 14. Okay. You, you're a stupid kid. Um, it will come back and bite you in the ass. And that's really terrifying. Like that really is going to make you want to like check yourself more. And don't get me wrong. In some ways that that could be a good thing, right? Like you don't want people being racist. On the other hand, it's also a bad thing because it crushes dissent and, and critical thought and, and, and different opinions. Because then you're going to want to conform. You don't want to be seen as somebody who's like, you know, bad and doesn't conform to what the majority expect of them. And so, yeah, I mean, okay, look, let's be honest. Everyone here has done and said things that they'd rather not be remembered for. You know, embarrassing things, stupid things, perhaps racist things, sexist things. I mean, look, we're all guilty of it. Unless you're like this like angel that just has never sinned in their life before, which I am super, super skeptical about. I, I think it's scary to think about like if everything you ever said was recorded. Um, so yeah, I would say like, yeah, watch yourself. Like record keeping has gotten very good. In fact, Wazowski, you didn't file your paperwork last night. Oh, that darn paperwork. Wouldn't it be easier if it all just blew away? Again. Yes, well, I'll, uh, I'll try to be less careless. I'm watching you, Wazowski. Always watching. Ooh, A little uh, illustration of the concept. <laughs> I love monster things. Okay, unfortunately for you, record keeping has gotten frighteningly good. It's not really possible for the average person to completely live off the grid. I mean, unless you're going to be some like weird mountain person. That means that there is a file on you somewhere, whether it's LAUSD or the NSA or you know the police, there's a file on you somewhere. There's also a very modern form of record keeping. And it's something that even Foucault himself could not have predicted. It's so devious because you keep track of it yourself. Anyone know what I'm talking about? This modern form of record keeping? Vivian? Are you talking about social media? I am definitely talking about social media. Social media. Okay, did you guys ever stop and think about how weird it is that you voluntarily give up so much of your own personal information? Like, you at all times are telling people where you are, what you're doing, what you look like, um, what you're, or who you hang out with, like who your friends are, who your family is, uh, what your family and friends look like, what you're eating. Uh, what, what your political views are. Like you are advertising all of that information publicly. And look, there's not that much of a generational gap between you and me. Like it's like what, 10 years? It wasn't the same when I was your age. When I was your age, social media was like just kind of like getting off the ground. That's not normal behavior for you to advertise every little detail about your life. Um, it wasn't always like that. Uh, Cassie, I'm sorry, you had a hand up? That's where like social media robbings, they like, there's like a really big rise in them where people were like saying, oh, going on vacation to blah, 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 for two weeks, gonna have fun. And then they would get robbed while they were gone because they advertised that they wouldn't be at home. Yeah, it's silly. Uh, but yeah, stuff like that happens all the time. Uh, uh, Kaylee? Yeah I, yeah, I think it's super weird. Like I don't want to be on social media because I don't want people to know this kind of stuff. Like I, I, I don't know, it confuses me. Right. No, I mean, it, 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 when you stop and think about it, you, you are voluntarily giving up all this information, your location, your spending habits. Um, and it's not like somebody is like insidiously like watching you. I mean, there's that, but it's more like you are voluntarily giving this all up. And that's weird. Like I, I'm, I'm trying, Foucault is trying to get you to realize as a historian, that's not the way people have operated normally. This is a brand new phenomenon. Uh, and is it a good thing or a bad thing? That remains to be seen. I mean, it's, it's not so simple that it's just one over the other. But Foucault, I think, wanted to point out, I think there's a lot of danger here. Um, and I think he's right. And so when you apply this to what you learned in Silva's class, I mean, yeah, social media. Um, last question, and then we'll break for today, because 
we're out of time. So one more time, how is social media an example of Foucault's examination or, or just discipline in general? So one, 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 one more question. Vivian. Um, I feel as like this will be piecewise, but like people who conform to like social media standards get rewarded for their behavior through like likes and comments and follows. And then they become role models in like society and therefore they create more trends and people just continue to conform to them and then perpetuate the entire system. Precisely. And so the same prejudices, the same bullshit, the same inequality will continue to perpetuate itself in this case through social media. And, and again, we'll get into this next week, but Foucault is very cynical and he would say that a lot of like reform campaigns, not all of them, but a lot of reform campaigns are doomed to failure from the start because they're not addressing the root problems of, of institutions. Um, and in fact, they may even do more harm than good, a lot of these protests, uh, by, because a lot of them, instead of challenging the system, end up simply reinforcing <laughs> those same uh, uh, inequalities and those same problems. Okay, I know, very cynical. I just want you to kind of sit with it for a little bit. We'll obviously have to go over this in more detail. Now, if you can't make, to, if you can't make it to class on Thursday, totally fine. Um, just I'll be recording the session like normal, um, so you can just watch it later. And if you can show up, then that's great too. Okay, then in that case, we are done for today, folks. I will stop recording right now. You can stick around for a minute or two if you like to chat. Otherwise, I will see you later. Good luck on your AP exams and uh, let me know how you're doing. Bye.